And this is based on GTO. It's not just something where I sit down loosey goosey having a sandwich and then, oh, let's uh, pick some hands. No, this is based on uh, GTO research. Welcome back everyone. Today I'm going to be sharing five tips on how to play flash draws. Very excited about this one. And of course, the purpose is not just me sitting here and sprinkling you with some wisdom. Take some notes, take a pen and paper, write down or do it in your online notepad, whatever it is. I want you to get the most out of it and then also implement that. It's not just done by listening, my friend. Theory is not everything. Practice is everything. And if you just just apply one tip, then you're already going to make progress step by step, little by little. Poker can be very confusing, very overwhelming. So make sure to take notes and then let's jump right into it. The first tip is more of a mindset tip. You need to get away of thinking in absolute hand strength. See it as a front end, right? A flush draw, a top pair. It's just the name that stands for equities, the back end. It's just a numbers game. We have a 3% equity, we have an 85% equity. The problem is, if you constantly think in flush draws, you sit, play it the same way over and over again, because the flush draw might have 45%, but it also might have 9%. There's a wide range of equities that can uh, yeah, can stand for the, 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 the flush draw, the top pair, the over pair you have, and so on and so forth. The problem is, if you constantly think in absolute hand strength, you have not the capability to make good laydowns. Let's say you have aces, the board is 985, you see that and you get a check raise. We often think, oh, we have to call a flop and turn and make, uh, otherwise we make ourselves exploitative or exploitable. And But if you shift your understanding from front end thinking to back end thinking and thinking in equities, then you would realize, oh, actually, I might only have 40 or 45% equity. I might be losing more half of the time. I'm not saying it's going to eradicate or solve all your problems in poker and you want to be play, playing perfect, but you will then start letting go of being attached to some beautiful looking hands that you have an emotional history with and instead operate from equity and not just names, flush draws, open straight draws, and this will help you to make good laydowns. Why is it so important? Because then we're also going to be able to make better calls when uh, yeah, we get the right odds or we make also good laydowns when we get the, uh, the wrong odds. This is something that has tr tremendously improved my win rates in poker. Uh, just letting go of all these terms, top pairs, uh, flush draws, it doesn't matter. What matters is how much equity your hand has. Sometimes in blind versus blind spots, your jack high has 80% and you can easily hero call. And sometimes your overpair under the gun versus under the gun where ranges are very tight um, might only have 30%, right? But if you think, oh, jack high, oh, it's always bad, then well, you will really get exploited against good opponents. But if you then have aces and you don't have the capability to let go because you connect aces with always winning and we human beings are very good in thinking that everything that has more than 70% equity always happens, right? If we have 75% equity, we feel like we're entitled to always win or we have 80%, we're entitled to always win. That's not a thing in poker. And I want you to shift your understanding from front end to back end. Think in equities. This is mandatory. This is mandatory not only for playing flash draws. This is mandatory for playing poker in general. I mean, for playing draws, it's a little more important because odds and outs, I'm going to play a more important role since you have to do some calculations in game, right? Am I getting the right odds? Uh, okay. Um, I'm, he's betting pot, turn to river, only one card to come. I have only 18% equity, pot size bet. I actually need 33% equity. It's going to hard to yeah realize my equity. Do I have implied odds? Yada, yada. All this kind of thought process that is going on. We we'll also get a little more detail later on in the next tips, but this is an essential mindset tip because everything else that I'm sharing, tip three, four, five, uh, two, three, four, five, uh, it's not going to really work out if you always feel so attached to your beautiful looking flash draw. I love you. I've tried to stop, but I can't. Let's continue with tip number two. 
always raise your strongest draws. Very often I see people overplaying very weak draws, check raising, facing a three bet and then having no clue how to continue. It's never minus the V to raise a flush draw, but the problem is it will very often put you in dicey situation where you start making mistakes. So as I said, raising draws is never a blunder, but then yeah, you might fuck it up later on. So we have the situation here where we face a raise from under the gun, we call and we flop a flush draw. And the question is, do we want to raise those this hand? Do we just want to call it? And of course, you definitely sometimes want to play your draws aggressively. If you just check call, it's going to be very easy to play against and um, you're very easy to, yeah, to be exploited, especially from better opponents. And especially in these days where people tend to see bet more than years ago, it, it definitely makes sense to, to play, draw, play draws aggressively. So the question is, which draws do we want to play aggressively? If we look into the spot here for 35 big blinds, you see that assuming he bets one third, which I still see way too often. Um, this is a board, as you can see here, um, where the in position player has a lot of hands that want to pile in as much money as possible already on the flop, especially over, play, over pairs, uh, vulnerable top pairs. It's a very dynamic board that coordinates quite good with the big blind. So assuming we face a one third pot size bet, uh, you can see that uh, not flush draws want to raise very often. Um, some king high flush draws, king queen, king jack just wants to call, wants to keep the 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 yeah the king tens, king nines in there. Uh, king ten, king nine really benefits from folding out king jack, king queen. Uh, you see, then the more we get to the queen highs and jack highs, we start raising less. Um, it, if we have two over cards, it's uh, it's it's never too bad to raise essentially either an ace high or king high flush draw or when you have two over cards and here you even have some back or straight draws as well uh, if we face a re-raise i mean if we face an all-in we have to fold of course this is quite a lot but if we face a three bet uh, we can then play a dependent decide if we can shove or we can uh, we should call. I think three bets in general, especially on these board textures, are quite strong. Especially if you play against an unknown, then we should probably um, raise forward. So and then if we go more towards like 10-7 flush draw, 10-6 flush draw, 10 deuce, you see all these flush draws are basically never raising unless yeah you have some really strong back to straight draw opportunities with a jack six or jack seven, or something like. I mean, 6-4, straight draw and flush draw. These are the hands you can you can always raise uh, and get it in. Uh, so it, if you have a gacha and a flush draw, these hands are no-brainers. This might sound very trivial, but I see players uh, fucking up these bots. So I think the way I simplify it is here. I would raise my nut flush draws. I would raise some of my stronger king high flush draws. And I would just call my uh, 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 smaller flush draws. As you can see here, the differences are almost non-existent like the V's are like 0 0.002 in difference so again raising or calling these kind of hands it's not such a big deal or not such a big difference however the problem is then we get put ourselves in spots that are unnecessary if we start raising too many weak draws and then you start making big mistakes you decide to make a stupid bluff in a 50 big blind spot and then this this hurts your win rate right but we if we raise our nut flush draw, we never come to the idea to yeah bluff a busted nut flush draw because we know or you should know that you don't want to be blocking the uh, nut flush draws in your opponent's range. So if you have a nine high flush draw or a ten high flush draw, then um, yeah you don't really. There are certain runouts where you might bluff, certain runouts where you don't want to bluff. So this is the problem that might cause you a lot of problems. If we look into some deeper stack sizes, so here we have have it for 100 big blinds and we face a one third pot size bet. We see that we're going to be mostly raising uh, nut flush draws and it gets even less here with those weaker hands, um, jack 10, jack 9, stay quite frequently, but a little bit less. So here, once again, you should be aiming for more stronger flush draws. Tip number three bluffing on the river when you have a busted draw make sure you bluff the weakest draws you don't want to be bluffing when you have a strong busted draw like an ace high 
uh, flush draw, uh, even some of the king high flush draws. So let's assume here we have a 10 4 in spades and we have a run out uh, that where we don't hit our flush draw and the opponent checks back on the turn, then we want to bluff our weakest draw. So let's have a look here. Um, let's assume uh, so we have more hands in our opponent's range. He bets three quarter pot. Uh, we call, as you can see, the bigger our opponent bets, actually, the less we want to be raising. So we call, and the turn is a rather neutral nine in clubs. We check, uh, it goes check, check, and the river is the, yeah, let's take the 10 in diamonds. So you see, if you, if you have a nut flush draw, ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, 10, even the king, queens, king, jacks, you don't really want to bluffing those because you still have some showdown value and you also block a lot of our opponent's folding range, right? Like ace high and king high flush draws. Um, so what hands are we bluffing with? Um, let's take, even if you have um, seven four in spades, right? Seven high flush draw. If you have a jack high flush draw, if you have a queen high flush draw, Right, you only block the queen in spades, but with king jack, you you don't want to block two bro uh, uh, spade Broadway cards because there you block way too much of your opponent's folding range. What else do we have? I mean, we have also such an incredible wide value range. We can even you know we can we can block bet any nine, any eight. Um, the ten is not really a scared card because the ten very often queen ten, jack ten are very natural bluffs, so those are not in our opponent's range. So it's only really ace ten and king ten. Um, so the moment we have a king eight, you can see we have a clear value bet here or even a queen eight because it's just so unlikely for our opponent to have the, the queen 10 or king 10. Um, yeah, or if you have a jack six here, you are value betting, uh, you're, you're bluffing it, right? Um, so I think this is something you need to understand uh, when it comes to bluffing, when let's say we bet one third pot even on the river, um, a big portion of our opponent you can see are the the ace king ace queen ace jack and spades that on this turn want to check back because we're going to be improving to a lot of two pairs and straight so check raising frequency goes significantly up we could also be check shoving something like 10 9 in spades or 9 7 in spades you know so or some combo draws if we now turn something like jack 10 queen 10 in spades so you want to be checking back your your ace king ace queen ace jack and spades quite frequently so if you block two of these cards when you have king queen king jack yourself you don't want to be bluffing with those it's a very easy rule of thumb if you really really crappy bottom of your range with your draws go ahead and bluff them this will really help you to uh, be always profitable I, I cannot imagine a simulation where this will not be profitable and of course there are always exceptions but every single time i've looked into a sim and we get to the river with the bottom of our draws where we don't block any stronger draws or Let's say we fold out our opponent's better draws, then you should go ahead and bluff. Tip number four, check back your weakest flush draws that cannot stand a check raise or check raise all in on the turn with less than 30 big blinds. A very common rule of thumb, the shorter you get, the more poker turns into a protection game, equity denial game. And of course, now with that stack size, your opponent can check shove on flop and turns easier on you. And it's your responsibility to protect your equity, especially with such draws that are dominated by a lot of better draws. So we can see that on the following hand, uh, where I open 10, eight and diamonds, we get a flush draw. First of all, this is a very standard seabed on this board. I think I should even size up a little, but it's fine. It's not a big of, of EV difference. And the turn is the king. If we now start betting 12,000 here, um, he can start check shoving his kings against us to maybe get a hero call from ace or protect against flush draws. So also he could check jam something like queen, jack and diamonds or whatever if he thinks we, we can forward an ace, but doesn't really matter. Point is that now the check raise likelihood increases with such a stack size. So let's look into that. So you see on this board, we can definitely use also bigger sizings, um, but betting small is also totally fine. 
what is the most common sizing is actually just uh, one six pot it's i mean you see that just by betting one big blind basically our opponent he he can't really do anything i mean if he jack five and hearts what what does he want to do right um turn is the king of clubs he checks again and you see that now we start checking back here hands like uh, 10 8 even hands like jack 10 and diamonds queen jack and diamonds uh, this is just a board where when we face a race especially on paired boards you have a lot of dirty outs uh, draws on paired boards are always very dangerous because let's say if the guy raises king five on the on the turn and you hit the five and diamonds you will have some dirty reverse implied odds what does it mean reverse implied odds always mean that uh, the outs that are helping you are also going to help your opponent and he will hit a stronger hand than yours so you will improve your chasing your draw to a draw to a flush to a flush but on the same time it, your opponent will improve to a full house and you still have to pay him out so uh, these reverse implied odds are quite big on pair boards and you need to pay attention to that so in general the way i approach these boards is i check back my weakest draws and i check back and i would barrel some of my stronger draws i mean again it's never really a big blunder to barrel your draws here the problem though is that and once again if you face raises we are not very familiar with those spots this is where we might fuck it up where we make big mistakes so i always try to simplify and try to just play my equities the better my draw i intend to keep barreling it the weaker my draw i check it back and by doing so i will also have some flushes in my check back range with that stack size if you have a flush you're gonna call a big bet or if he bets more you're gonna raise and you also don't mind playing for stacks and the king improves his range quite a lot anyway since he's gonna have more kings than we have in fact he's actually supposed to establish a leading range on the turn with a 15 percent frequency 15 yeah almost now yeah, 14 anyway so we can also look into some other turns so let's say if the turn is the seven and hearts uh, you see the same spiel here even with 10 8 diamond diamonds wants to check back uh, quite frequently um, yeah the the diamond gut shot draws here queen jack jack 10 want to be checking back uh, all these hands here very very high frequency checkbacks queen eight and diamonds almost a pure checkback right this is where a lot of people always want to bet and then they are surprised when they face jams or raises and they don't know what to do even though we only bet one uh, let's assume if we bet bigger on the flop um yeah actually it never wants so the thing is you never really want to bet your flush cross big because it really sucks uh lowering the stack to pot ratio um the the check raising likelihood is not that high though but um yeah you you just with that stack size you make yourself very difficult you make your life very difficult when you bet big uh, with flush draws so yeah just bet small and yeah you see we're basically sorry we're basically checking queen jack and diamonds 100 percent of the time queen 10 diamonds queen 8 we check those hands 100 percent of the time uh if we take let's take a low card If we take a low card, not a king, that improves his range. Then we keep barreling the gut shots, as you can see here. Queen, jack, queen, 10. Uh, and then if we don't have an additional gut shot, a very weak flush to just queen high, then we check it back and, and, and try to hit our hand. Uh, and 10, 8 also, you would see in case we have would bet it, it would be a little more, a little higher AV in checking than in betting. So what else would we barrel? while we would barrel hands we don't mind folding right so it's a more polarized betting strategy polarized means we either have a very strong hand like an ace queen an ace nine or ace jack or we have a very trashy hand as you can see here we barrel all these lower pairs with the intention to fold out nine x hands and all these broadway floats like queen jack queen jack queen 10 and even some king x start folding um so these hands and sevens we don't mind bet folding 
we don't mind bet folding a queen 10 or a jack 10. So you have enough hands you can still bury with. You can check back your some of your king eggs, some of your weakest weaker ace eggs. You check back some of your flushers and you still have a strong check back range. Don't think, oh, I'm getting exploited. No, you're not. But this is a very strong strategy to protect your equity. And it applies on a lot of different board textures, not just on ace, king, nine. Tip number five. Please do not chase your draws at all cost, odds and outs. And I made a separate video about this basic um, learning methods in poker, uh, the basic requirements you need to understand in poker, odds and outs. Let's make a very, very quick sum. I always feel like we have to continue calling all our draws. No, that's not right. So let's assume we call our um, our jacks, jack, deuce and clubs here on the flop. Uh, the turn is the nine and clubs. We check, he bets, let's say, two-third to three-quarter pot. Uh, you see, we actually start folding. Against the pot size bet, we fold it 100% of the time, right? So there, we're not going to be fucking around. I mean, raising is an option, but you see it's minus EV. So if I let the simulation run longer, it would also be a clear fold. Why can we not call against the pot size bet? If someone bets 14 into 14, we need 33% equity. With a flush draw, you only got eight outs. If you apply that times two multiplier rule, which means um, you have eight outs, uh, sorry, you have nine outs, open and straight draw is eight outs. If you have nine outs, then you will have around 18% equity. So this is very basic stuff that you need to know in poker. If you would go from flop to river, so you flushed on the flop, then you again multiply it by two, you have around 35, 36% equity. One card less to come, turn to river, you have only 18% equity. That's essential and you need to know that. So then your opponent, if your opponent goes down, he maybe bets two thirds, three quarter pot, you might only need uh, 26, 27% equity. And then you have some implied odds, right? So if you hit your flush, you might keep bluffing, uh, here your jack might be good, right? So that's why against the two-third, three-quarter uh, bet, it becomes a little more profitable. But basic rule for calling, and please write this down, this will help you very often. Whenever you face a bet that is larger than two-third pot size and you don't have an additional overcard, so let's say, let's take the tenant clubs, Um, you see, for example, nine deuce and hearts uh, spades here, right? You have no overcard, you have no flush, uh, you have no gut shot, only the nine high flush draw. You see, it would be actually a very bad call. So here, our opponent opponent bets around, uh, what does he bet? Nine into ten? No, how much is the pot? Fourteen. Sorry, nine into fourteen. So it's actually only a two third pot size bet, and we fold our very weak flush draw. Again, only if we start having an overcard, it gets more close to break even. And then if we have a gut shot, we, we can continue calling or an overcard or a very strong overcard, an ace or a king. This is always fine to call. If, then if he goes for the pot size bet, then it's essentially basically only the nut flush draws that want to call. Or when you have a gut shot, as we can see here with the queen nine, with the jack nine, uh, jack seven, those hands then are still good enough to call because you have the nine outs for the um, for the flush draw, plus you have the four outs for the gut shot, so you have 13 outs, so you have around 25, 26% equity. Yes, you need 33, but you always have some implied odds, and especially if the gut shot is an out that is very disguised, that will sometimes, yeah, where you're gonna scoop a very big pot. And of course, sometimes one of your, uh, if, if you have a jack seven here, your jack might be live, uh, might be good, your opponent then might give up, or you hit your seven, your opponent gives up. So these options exist as well. So you might actually have, instead of only uh, 14 outs, you might actually have 15 outs, and then you see it gets closer to the 33. And especially when you have an, when you have an ace, king, queen, or jack high flush, it's very unlikely for your opponent to have a flush draw. So he's either sitting on a value hand or on a bluff, and then of course all the pair outs are gonna be helping you as well. Um, Sometimes you have also reverse implied odds when you ha when he has a nut flush draw and you have a king high flush draw, you hit your flush, but this is uh, uh, going to be happening less often than all the other instances that I was just listing. And for raising, so let's assume 
on the nine of clubs on the turn, same spot we where we're supposed to lead. So we lead our nine deuce or jack deuce in spades and we face a race. You see, same principle here, like jack deuce, we're basically folding. Ten deuce, we're folding. Uh, I mean, nine deuce, we have a pair, so we're not folding, but jack deuce, ten deuce, we cannot continue. Also, a rule of thumb, if your opponent raises more than three times your bet, everything that has not an additional gut shot, not an additional straight draw, or not an additional overcard, at least an ace or king, you can fold. It's that easy. This is a very overgeneralized rule, and sometimes even when you have an ace or king, it might be minus CV, but it will at least help you in, in let's say, 90% of the spots. And a bonus tip that points more towards preflop, since the, the hands you're playing preflop will correlate with your postflop action, of course. And when you're under the gun, I see a big, big mistake that people are opening way too many suited connectors. This is the range that I've made for the term masterclass for 100 big blinds. And this is based on GTO. It's not just something where I sit down loosey goosey having a sandwich and then, oh, let's uh, pick some hands. No, this is based on uh, GTO research and it might open the 9-8 suited a bit more often, but essentially you don't want to be opening 8-7 eight, seven, eight, seven suited, 6-7 suited. I mean, just, yes, you're deep, you want to play suited connectors, but you want to play them in position. You want to play them against tight ranges. You don't want to be the one that has 7-6 suited. And what happens, the players behind, they are also deep. They're going to be flooding you with king-8 suited. They're going to be flooding you with queen-8 suited. They're going to be flooding you with suited aces. And when you hit your flush with 8-7 suited or 9-8 suited and the money goes in, very often you're going to be behind. So this is where even GTO is telling you against reasonable flooding ranges, hey, it's actually not good to open those hands. So this is something that you need to eradicate from your game plan playing those low pairs and low pseudo connectors from the earliest position since the deeper you are, the lower your equitalization and you will simply lose EV by playing out of position. And that's where you want to start avoiding or start taking out those pseudo connectors from your opening range. All right? That's it for this video. If you have another helpful tip, share it in the comments. Um, also let me know, do you like this kind of format where I take a certain spot and I give you some tips that help you in your game, maybe five tips for playing from the button. What would you like to see? What kind of advice videos or tip videos would you like to see where I sit down, make some research and then provide my uh, solutions with you? I'm really enjoying this kind of format at least. Let me know what you guys think. And of course, if you do enjoy it, make sure to really smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and then see you guys next time.